Now, I say that not to make light of the situation. We know now what we didn't know then. Which is it can cause problems if children get exposed to lead at elevated levels. But the point is that as long as kids are getting good health care, and folks are paying attention. And they're getting a good education, and they have community support, and they're getting some good home training. and they are in a community that is loving and nurturing and thriving, these kids will be fine. And I don't want anybody to start thinking that somehow all the kids in Flint are going. to have problems for the rest of their lives, because that's not true. That is not true. We've learned a lot of things since I was a kid. I used to have adults blowing smoke in my face all the time. And so community organizations, churches, etc., one of the things that we need to do is And I've talked to the governor and the mayor about this is set up a system of outreach so that we're getting everybody as a village looking out for every child. Making sure that they're getting checked up, making sure they've got pediatric care. Making sure they're being tested effectively, making sure then that they're getting nutritious food. Just to give you an example, we know that if kids are getting vegetables and eating properly, that, just by itself, is going to have some impact on any effects of lead. But I know that here in Flint there are whole neighborhoods that don't even have a supermarket. So we're going to have to figure out how to get supermarkets in those communities. So I say all this just to indicate you should be angry, but channel that anger.
you should be hurt, but don't sink into despair. And most of all, do not somehow communicate to our children here in the city that they are. going to be saddled with problems for the rest of their lives. Because they will not. I talked longer than I was going to. Just a couple more points. What happened here is just an extreme example. An extreme and tragic case of what's happening in a lot of places around the country. We've seen unacceptably high levels of lead in townships. Along the Jersey Shore and in North Carolina's major cities. We've seen it in the capitals of South Carolina and Mississippi and even, not long ago. Lead contaminated drinking water was found right down the street from the United States Capitol. So Flint is just a tip of the iceberg in terms of us reinvesting in our communities. So my hope is, is that this begins a national conversation. about what we need to do to invest in future generations. And it's no secret that, on this pipeline of neglect, a lot of times it's the most poor folks who are left behind. It's working people who are left behind. We see it in communities across the Midwest that haven't recovered since the plants shut down. We see it on inner city corners where they might be able to drink the water, but they can't find a job. We see it in the rural hills of Appalachia. We've got to break that mindset that says that that neighborhood over there, that's not my problem, those kids over there.
They don't look like my kids exactly, so I don't have to worry about them out of sight, out of mind. We've got to break that attitude that says somehow there's an us in them. And remind ourselves that there's just one big we the American family, and everybody has got to look out for each other. So let me just close by saying this. Look, I know this has been a scary time. I know this is disappointing. You've been let down. But there is a sermon about a phoenix rising from these ashes. And there is the opportunity out of this complete screw up, this painful tragedy. This neglect, this disappointment to actually pull together and make for a better future. Sometimes it takes a crisis for everybody to focus their attention. Because there have been a lot of crises going on in Flint. They just weren't as loud and noisy, and nobody noticed. There are a lot of small, quiet crises going on in the lives of people around this country. And this helps lift it up. And when we see it, and we understand it, and we feel it, then maybe we start making a connection with each other. And that begins to change our mindset and improve our politics and improve our government to make it more responsive and more accountable. And the good news is, is that that's the natural mindset of our young people. That's why I'm so hopeful about the people of Flint. That's why I'm so hopeful about America generally, is I meet young people all the time. And they've got a mindset just like little Miss Flint here.
she decides, I'm just going right to the president, because I think we can fix this. Or the mindset of Isaiah raising $15,000 to help an elementary school where he's never been. That's America. That's who we are at our best. We are a nation of individuals, and we should be proud of everything that we can. Accomplish on our own through hard work and grit and looking after our own families. And making sure we're raising our children right. But we don't do these things alone. Ultimately, our success is dependent on each other. Our success is dependent on each other. I have had the privilege of being the President of the United States. A big office an office that gives me enormous power and enormous responsibility. But the thing I've learned in that job is that I can't do it by myself. I can't fix every problem on my own. I need a mother-in-law who helps Michelle and me raise Malia and Sasha. I need incredible staff who are carrying out our policies to sign people up for health care. I've got to have our incredible men and women in uniform who are willing to go overseas and fight on behalf of our freedom. And, most of all, I need fellow citizens who share the values that built this. great country and are willing to work with me and work together to make it better. I said this before, the most important office in a democracy is the office of citizen. It's more important than the president. More important than any senator or governor or mayor. So, Flint, I'm here not just to say I've got your back.
I'm here not just to say that you will get help. I'm also here to say you've got power. I'm also here to say you count. I'm also. Here to say that you can make a difference and rebuild the city better than ever. And you'll have a friend and partner in the President of the United States. God bless you. God bless Flint. God bless Michigan. God bless the United States of America. Barack Obama. Address at Fort Bonifacio. Delivered April 29, 2014, Manila, Philippines. Hello, everybody. Please, have a seat. Kumustikeo. It is great to be here at Fort Bonifacio. Vice President Binoy, distinguished guests. It's an honor to be here with our outstanding allies the leaders and members of the armed forces of the Philippines. And we're joined by men and women who stand tall and proud to wear the uniform of the United States of America. And let me also welcome all our Filipino friends. Now, I'm not going to give a long speech, because it's hot and people are in uniform. I hope you don't mind me not wearing my jacket. And I also want to make sure that I have some time to shake some hands. But I'm here in the Philippines to reaffirm the enduring alliance between our two countries. I thank President Aquino for his partnership and the deeper ties that we forged yesterday. I'm especially proud to be here as we remember one of the defining moments of our shared history the 70th.
anniversary of the Battle of Leyte during World War II and the beginning of the liberation of the Philippines. Right after this, I'll pay my respects at the American Cemetery here in Manila the final resting place of So many Americans and Filipinos who made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedom of this country in that war. These Americans and Filipinos rest in peace as they stood in war side by side. Shoulder to shoulder Balakitan. Together, Filipinos and Americans put up a heroic defense at Bataan and Corregidor. Together, they endured the agony of the death marches and the horror of the prisoner of war camps. Many never made it out. In those years of occupation, Filipino resistance fighters kept up the struggle. And hundreds of thousands of Filipinos fought under the American flag. And sadly, the proud service of many of these Filipino veterans was never fully recognized by the United States. Many were denied the compensation they had been promised. It was an injustice. So in recent years, My administration, working with Congress and others, have worked to right this wrong. We passed a law, reviewed the records, processed claims, and nearly 20. Zero 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 Filipino veterans from World War II and their families finally received the compensation they had earned. And it was the right thing to do. What's been written about Bataan could be said of their entire generation. The loss of life was grievous, and hardly a Filipino family was untouched by the tragedy. But the heroic struggle brought out the best in the Filipino character in the face of adversity and served as a beacon to freedom-loving peoples everywhere.